Today I'm going to be talking about the effects of domestication on the brain. So this is really stretching the definition of neuroplasticity. I know I've talked mostly through this course about having a very specific rigid definition of neuroplasticity, and now I'm going to kind of violate that rule a little bit. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it's a, a fascinating story, and I do think it does illustrate just the the flexibility of brain patterns and overall brain structure. Um, and it has a really interesting, at least hypothesized mechanism for how this comes about. So the relationship here is the, is something called the domestication syndrome. So syndrome sounds like it's kind of bad, but really what it means, it's a collection of features or I wouldn't really call them symptoms, characteristics, phenotypes that are uh, that appear to be kind of a pattern that we see in domesticated species. So I'm going to walk through what some of those collected features are, but since this is a neuroscience class, I'm going to start off with talking about the brain. So the brains of domesticated animals are substantially smaller than their wild counterparts. So this is one of the features that's typically associated with the domestication syndrome. Uh, and this is a figure showing the percent difference of brains from domesticated species compared to their wild counterparts. So for instance, pigs have a brain that's nearly 30, 33% smaller than its wild counterpart. This is the biggest difference that we see. And then if you look in the carnivores, you see somewhat similar percentages, even the ungulates, horses, llamas, and sheep, big differences here. Um, mouse, rat, rabbits, and guinea pigs, much you know smaller brains. Even in birds, domesticated pigeons and the lowly turkey, the hokey bird, is uh, got a brain that's almost like a pig. So, um, and so one of the one of the ideas behind this is that okay, well, with domestication, you want you want dumb animals. You want animals that are going to be docile, dumb, and dumb animals are not going to figure out how to escape. That makes sense, and that there's probably some truth to that. That um, the smaller the overall brain to body ratio, which is one measurement of like overall basic intelligence, the smaller that is, the, uh, the more dumb that animal is going to be. Um, and, and even just comparing overall brain size would be, would be some indication that there's, there's some reason to think that that could be the case. However, you can see in here that, uh, but there's a lot of exceptions to this. And I think if any of you have had pets, especially cats and dogs, dogs in particular, they're very smart. Um, they can learn basically how to learn uh, any sort of language commands, uh, and they can do some amazing tricks. You, they have amazing personalities. They're very, you know, friendly and lovely, and cats are maybe less so, and they don't really learn tricks, but you could teach some cats tricks. But they're very, very smart. They rule the house. Um, ferrets are also, you know, sweet and also smart in many ways. And so this this is, you don't necessarily see the pattern following here. It's kind of hard to argue that dogs are stupider than, say, wolves, which is what they were selected from. So much so that they're like 30% stu more stupid. Um, so that's just, you know, there isn't a lot of reason to think that that's a good argument. Another thing that's part of the domestication syndrome, this is one thing that's often brought up, is that piebald coloration is common in domesticated species. So we got horses and so piebald, piebald for those of you that don't know this, this is just black and white coloration with like spotty coloration. Um, Dalmatians and chickens even, they you know, we have domesticated breeds of chickens that have all kinds of different white and black spots. Pigs, uh, rats, kitties, even cows. The, there's a beer that's made in Wisconsin from New Glarus Brewing Company. It's quite delicious. And their, their most famous beer is called the Spotted Cow. So you know, I had to include that in here. So that's one other feature that's associated with domestication. And we don't really see this kind of coloration in their wild counterparts. Now, it turns out that there are some exceptions to this. Um, uh, apparently, you can find some of this kind of coloration in wild rat populations. And also amongst goats, there appears to be that there's some where you can see kind of a piebald coloration. But there's there's no doubt that color coats in domesticated species are, are widely different from their wild counterparts. 
Another thing that we see in domesticated species, not all of them, but some of them, is that they tend to have floppy ears. So dogs, this, this puppy here, he's got some floppy ears. Um, big goofy bunny rabbits will have floppy ears. And this is, turns out that it, this is something that we see just in domesticated breeds of bunnies. And we compare that to the wild counterparts. We don't see this kind of floppy ear configuration in the wild counterparts of the, spe of the, uh, of the domesticated version. Another part of the domestication syndrome is that many species, or at least breeds within the species, have um, shorter snouts and they have smaller teeth. So wolves tend to have a very long pronounced snout with quite big teeth relative to their overall head size. And dogs, even dogs that have kind of long snouts, like a Labrador, or this looks like a Bernese Mountain Dog or something like that, um, their snouts are shorter overall relative to the head size. And then we have some breeds of dogs that are very, very short. And this is also true for some cats too. Cats tend to be quite short. Um, and then you compare them to their wild counterparts. So this is, a, this is the wild African cat, I think. And it has bigger teeth, longer snout relative to its whole head. So shorter snouts, that's another interesting feature. So there are more features that are part of the domestication syndrome. And this is a table listing a lot of them. It comes from this paper here. And, um, you, you know, one thing you can see with this table. So, so the idea is that, like, you know, we've got animals that have been selected over time. They come from different, they have different common origins. Uh, so they're very different in their overall um, makeup. And, it, and it's quite a range of different kinds of animals that we see. Um, uh, but at some point in the development of human civilization, humans decided that these different species would serve some sort of purpose, you know, either being a pet or a working animal or food. So, um, and, and so therefore there would be some sort of selection. And one thing that we can see in this table, like, first of all, that not every single feature is consistent across all animals. Obviously that's not the case, but, um, we see some things that are more common than others. So it really does seem like depigmentation is a, a pretty common feature across domesticated species. And another very common feature is decreased brain size. But there's one thing that's common across all domesticated versions of, um, of wild animals, and that is increased tameness. An animal has to be tamed in order to be domesticated. And that makes sense, right? So that's going to be the one thing that's going to be consistent across that. And that's actually going to be key to all of this as we go through here. So there's an interesting example of domestication and just how quickly it can come about. And this comes from a project run by Dmitry Belayev and his project to help with the domestication or the selection of foxes that were being farmed in Siberia. So Dmitry Belayev was a geneticist and in Soviet Russia, um, Mendelian genetics was treated kind of like how, say, Darwinian evolution is treated sometimes in the United States. There's a lot of skepticism over Mendelian genetics little weird, I realize. Um, and, um, and, to, you know, but the idea was that like, um, you inherit genes and those genes are going to be, have an, an enormous influence over your, your overall phenotype and your personality and behavior. <clears throat> now, Dmitry Belayev felt that like, okay, the genetic hypothesis is generally true and rush the Soviet, um, decision-making process decided to suppress his teachings and work and they sent him to Siberia to help with the farming of foxes and what he ended up doing there is running a long-term domestication experiment and so we're going to talk a little bit about that so in the in the experiment um, Dmitry Blyev had was only doing selection for tameness towards humans. So when he was doing this experiment, um, he had a, a large collection of foxes 
and they would do this procedure where they would walk up to the cage and they would see what the reaction of the fox was going to be. They would have a quantification measurement of like how tame, naturally tame the fox was as the human approached, as the human stuck their hand into the cage and they would look for the reaction. And this is a link to a, a YouTube video just showing this, um, what this, the aggressive and tameness looks like. And so you'll, if you click on this link, well, not on right here, I will have a link up here. Um, you will see a video where they're showing the foxes acting aggressively towards a human, and then a, a fox that is very gentle and sweet, and actually is like playing with the human. So in this in this experiment, after generations and generations of doing this, Dmitry Blyev had this line of foxes that had um, a very tame demeanor. And in fact, you can, you can buy these foxes and have them as pets. And I've seen videos of people using these foxes and walking them around like, like a dog. And they seem to act like a dog, but they, are, they look a lot like a fox. It's pretty crazy. But another interesting thing that emerged in this process is that um, in this domestication experiment, when they were selecting just for tameness, so that when they would do this experiment, they would assess the population, they would find some individuals that were really aggressive, and they would breed those with, uh, with aggressive individuals. They found some individuals that were very tame, and then we would breed those with tame individuals. That was the only selection procedure. They didn't do anything else in the selection. Okay. What they found was that the ones that were tame ended up having predominantly floppy ears. So this is a baby fox with little floppy ears. They also had shorter stature and a shorter tail. Their tail was curly. And then the other thing is that many of these foxes had piebald coloration or a lot of white in their coat. And so it's not typical that a fox is gonna have a white tail like this. Um, and you can, as you saw in the previous slide, the one that I kept link showing on the on the right, that was a fox that has that was uh, a tame fox, and you could see that it was predominantly white. Um, whereas the aggressive foxes continued to look dark and act, and of course act aggressive, and have uh, you know normal looking ears, and they didn't have curly tails. So doing this selection procedure led to these domestic features coming about even though all he was doing is selecting for tameness. So it's a really interesting thing that emerged out of this experiment. And so this gave some credence to the idea that there is a domestication syndrome and that the process of taming animals causes this suite of features to come about. Now, it turns out the Russia, Russian domestication fox story is a little bit more convoluted than what's been reported. So the story that I gave you is the, the more common story. Some of you may have already heard it, but a paper came out recently. This was just last year, 2020. <clears throat> Another reason to, to dislike 2020. No, I'm just kidding. This, is, this has got a lot of important information and good critique, critiques on the whole domestication syndrome. Um, you know, a lot, one, one important fact that a lot of people had missed is that the Russian fox fur industry was started in like the 1920s. And they got a, an importation of foxes from Canada to start their, their farming of foxes. Now, it turns out that the foxes that were given from, that came from Canada to, uh, to Russia, that it came from a farming industry that had been around since the mid 19th century. And since, you know, when you're doing this kind of farming, you are obviously going to have some selection for tameness and the other thing is that foxes, of course, the reason why they're being farmed at all is so that you can have their furs. And there was selection for different fur coats, so different color coats. And there were examples of uh, foxes that, that had popped up in the, the farm population that had sort of a very white distinct color coordination. You can see that this is actually probably like a, an older picture from like the 1920s or something, but this is a, what you looks a lot like the, the Russian domesticated foxes. And here's a picture of the Russian fox. And this is, this is a, um, you know, a worker in Siberia that's working with these domesticated foxes. You can see that the domesticated foxes, uh, 
come right up to the person. This is not what the aggressive foxes do. They run away and they would attack. And this is this is the Canadian picture. So this is a picture from Prince Edward Island of of um, you know the one of the main Canadian fox farmers during that time period. And he's got a fox up on his shoulder. And you can see these foxes are, I mean, it's probably meal time. So of course they're interested, but you know, they look like dogs really. So there's probably, what this suggests is that the po population given to Russia likely already had some of the genetic predisposition for some of these domestication traits. So this is not something you typically see in the wild in foxes. Um, and this behavior certainly is something that you don't see in the wild, but it does indicate that the selection might be something that takes a little bit more time than just the you know 15 to 20 generations that they did in Russia in order to get this feature to come about. They still had these distinct lines, the, the aggressive line and the tame line. And the tame line still had a lot of these domesticated features. It's just that this population that was given to Russia likely came from a stock that already had some of these genes in it. So there's that. And then, you know, so this, this article also goes into a lot of other reasons to doubt the domestication syndrome uh, overall. And, you know, if you want to learn more about the opposite side of this um, hypothesis, you can look at that article. Belayev, he didn't restrict his research just to, uh, to um, foxes. He also did experiments with the brown Norway rat. And he... He, he was doing a very similar thing where he had aggressive rats that were bred with aggressive and tame rats bred with tame. And in, and in this experiment, within eight to 10 generations, rats showed a huge difference in tameness between the two lines. And this has been an ongoing experiment um, where they just continued to do this, uh, aggressive with aggressive and tame with tame. And then they did research at the 64th generation to assess behavior and physiology. And so this is a paper that was published in 2008. We're going to look a little bit at that. So we're going to look at a couple of videos of these rats um, from these two lines, lines, and we're going to look at the human approach um, aggressive, uh, um, uh, you know, the reaction that these lines have to um, human approach. And so we're going to see the. Yeah. 
looks like it's the video for it's actually gone. Uh, yeah, Emma's now putting her hand down in front of the rat. And uh, just, yeah, I know it looks frozen, but it's actually still going. starting population so had a group of rats this is this is an experiment that was originally started by Dmitry Belayev and this is now an evaluation of these rats at the 64th generation so we're going to look a little bit at this and I also wanted to mention that the uh the Clinton lab in the um in the school of neuroscience has done an enormous amount of work on lines of tame and aggressive rats and, and done some really interesting studies on this. So you can definitely look up information on Dr. Sarah Clinton's work. Um, super interesting research. Um, and then also even they're doing some new stuff on epigenetics and it's, it's really great stuff. But we'll, we're gonna look a little bit more at the data from this paper. So um, in this experiment, they just did startle response to auditory stimuli. Um, so, uh, and then what they're looking at here is pressure applied to the pressure sensor. So they were sitting on a, on a sensor and if, and when you have a startle response, these rats, they jump. And so we're looking to see like how much, how much they push against this plate when they jump. And there's going to be some habituation that occurs. So the first time they do it, that's going to be basically the maximal response. Um, and this is males, this is females. And you can see that both males and females have a pretty high pressure that they do, but the, the, the aggressive rats are here and this is the tame rats. And you can see already the tame rats are applying a pressure that's relatively low compared to the aggressive rats and it's significantly so in females. And then, the, uh, and then that pattern just holds true as habituation occurs. So both groups tend to get less and less startly, but you can see that like the aggressive rats are applying pressure that's higher at the very end of the stu stu uh, study at trial 10 if for, and this is just males this number is higher than by trial 2. so by trial 2 the tame line is already more chilled out than what the aggressive rats are after 10 trials and if you look at females it's even worse where the lowest amount of pressure that's being applied by these um by the aggressive rats is just about as high as the highest the very first exposure in the tame females. So the, 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 the difference between the aggressive females and the tame females is really pretty extraordinary. So it turns out that, um, you know, not surprisingly that there's some differences that emerge in overall levels of uh, cortisol in these animals, that the aggressive rats have higher levels of cortisol given how freaked out they are. Um, this isn't, I don't know if this was statistically significant. You can see it's higher here, but this was definitely statistically significant where at least in females, the aggressive rats have higher levels of cortisol. Just so the stress hormone cortisol is higher in these animals than it is in tame animals. And so that, and that would be consistent with this pattern. But what about changes in brain size? Now we've got this suite of features and we're doing some of the physiological evaluation of this let's see what brain size looks like. so um there are uh th this is a study from 
uh, the wild mink compared to the domesticated mink. So this is domesticated, that's the squares, and the wild mink is here. And what we have here, this might be a little tough to understand, but I'll walk you through it. So on the y-axis, we have log brain weight. So this is the log scale of brain weight. Minks can be quite a bit different in their overall brain size, um, but, uh, and so we have 0 0.7 to 1.1 as the log scale. And then you can see 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, it's getting like progressively smaller. And that's because like at one, this is 10, because that's log scale. Um, so there's that. Um, that and, and this is the actual weight here. Uh, but the, the data on here is the log scale. Now, um, uh, the same goes for uh, overall body weight. And you can see the range for mink is somewhere anywhere from as little as like 250 grams all the way up to um, more than a kilogram. So they can vary quite a bit. And what you should see is that almost all of the squares is to the right of all of the circles. And so they, in this, they had a couple, I think they had males and females. And that's part of the reason why you see like bunching here, males and females. Um, I think that this was probably females. This is males. I'm not too sure. Um, but all the squares are to the right of all the circles, which means that they're heavier. They're just, these are bigger. And it makes some sense that you would want this because you would want your mink to be, have, be bigger so they have more fur. Um, but the other thing though that's interesting is that brain weight does not scale with body weight. That within these domesticated versions, they got slightly bigger, but the brains didn't get bigger, which is something that you would expect. You would expect the brain to body ratio to be mostly the same, but instead it looks like the brain to body ratio is probably around 20% less in wild mink versus um, the domesticated version. So. There's, this is just a, a nice example showing this. There are other studies showing this in other domesticated species of mammals. So I'm gonna talk about um, another result that follows along from this mink experiment. Um, but, uh, and, and there are several experiments that show this, but we're gonna be looking at an example of this from uh, birds. And so in this experiment, there's a group of scientists that had taken jungle fowl, wild species called jungle fowl, and they, brought them in and they started to do this taming experiment where they they would assess them for tameness fear of humans they had some that were high fear of humans and some that were low fear of humans and then they did the selection experiment where they they bred the tame ones with the tame ones they bred the more the the low the low the high fear with the high uh high fear ones low fear with low fear ones and they did this for nine generations okay and then they did a fear uh, test in these jungle fowl and the first time they did this so in this fear test they put them into a chamber and then they would flash a light a blue light and then that would startle the birds the birds these birds don't like flashes of light and so then they would just look at the fear reaction and this just like any habituation experiment you can see that the first time they do it the all the birds are freaking out and then eventually over time they learn that it's not so bad and you can see on average the first time that they're doing this experiment um, across the 10 trials, oh, at least the first nine trials, that the high fear animals, this is fear of humans, right? So they've been selected for high, having high fear of humans or low fear of humans, that the high fear of humans also have a slightly higher startle response. And that's the first time they do it. But the second time they do it, you, we can see that the, um, the low fear um, jungle fowl are significantly less to have a startle response the second time. Whereas the high fear jungle fowl basically do the same kind of pattern as they did the first time. It's as if they didn't remember it at all. Um, so clearly prior experience changed the way that these birds are going to react the next time. And, you know, so there's, there's some interesting hypotheses to be drawn about like why this difference would emerge. What would be the role of cortisol in shaping that? Um, difference, um, you know, so if, if these, if the, the high fear birds have a stronger pulse of cortisol, um, because that they're just a little bit more, you know, they're less tame and they're a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more scaredy cats, um, that that might, uh, lead to a, a greater salience of this terrible experience of the flashing light so that they, um, are afraid of it next time. Whereas for the, um, 
the the low ones you might expect that maybe they didn't have such a terrible experience and so it wasn't as salient because it had lower levels of cortisol that's just a hypothesis so um yeah but a really interesting phenomenon in just after nine generations of selection so in this same group um this is a, a study that's a little bit older um than than the one we just saw um uh, this is just after five generations so here we have the first generation and they looked at body uh, brain weight right here and they had animals again they had uh, groups of animals after five generations where they just bred them at random they had groups of jungle fowl that were high fear of humans that's the high group and they had animals that were low fear of humans that's the low group and really interestingly that we have a significant difference between the high group and the low group. And in fact, the high group, so high fear of humans had a slightly bigger brain and the low group had a slightly smaller brain. So, and this is just after five generations of selection. So there really does seem to be something to this tameness and small brain size thing coming along. And we've, again, I think that we've, I've really hit this pattern over and over again. So why don't we get into the mechanism of why this might be one so, so right, we've got artificial selection as the obvious mechanism, right? Okay, yeah, so obviously there's selection that's going to this. Um, with domestication, you've got the, sh you know, the shortening of the snout, the reduced sexual dimorphism is another thing that's in there, increased, increased tameness being the most important thing. Um, and there's a lot of things that happen in here, obviously. With domestication um, from a wild ancestor, you have isolation, so the group is gonna be completely separate. So, so now you have a distinct genetic population. You have these other genetic things happening, such as population bottlenecks and genetic drift. Um, nutrition is gonna be another thing. And also ecological release is another aspect. So um, the challenges of living out in the wild are not so much so in the um, once you're domesticated. So um, those are things that are pressures uh, and, and obviously things to take into account with domestication. But what's what's leading to this change, right? Like, is it all this to explain it? Well, maybe not. So in order to explain this next part, I got to give just a brief, brief, brief overview of neurodevelopment. The brain is part of what's called ectoderm. It is uh, it emerges actually from like the outer part of the embryo. So this red part is the thing in the early embryo at the blastula stage that's going to turn into the brain and so if you were to cut across you would have like this inner part this would be endoderm there'd be mesoderm and then there's ectoderm which is gives rise to the skin and the brain so the brain and the skin emerge from the same part of the embryo which is really kind of crazy and so if you look at the top view of the embryo here you would this red part is the part that's going to end up being the brain eventually you go further and further along development and then it starts to the embryo starts to turn into these like you know kind of uh, sushi rice size things um, and um, and then in, but if and there's a top part and a bottom part right dorsal ventral if you look at that top part you will see something called the neural fold there will be this line at the top of the embryo and so you have the neural fold here and another fold here and in between is something called the neural plate and so this is the brain that's emerging on the outside of the embryo and the rest of this is going to be the skin the epidermis right so eventually what happens is that, oh, so how does the brain get into the, into the body? It's not, it's not on the skin. So why don't we get into that? Um, the neural plate. So this is like a cross section from the neural plate. If we were to cut the embryo coronally and we have the neural plate boulder border, this would be the, the neural folds here. Um, eventually what happens is that the neural plate starts to, to get pushed further and further into the embryo. And then the neural folds get kind of pushed in to, as part of this as well, as part of the neural tube. And, and so eventually it just makes a tube. So the, this outer part of the embryo folds over on itself. And now you have a tube on the inside and that is the, the nervous system, the central nervous system. So that is the spinal cord. And then at the very front part is gonna be the brain. And then that tube is the you know the the inside of the tube is going to be the ventricles eventually and that's the connected to the tube inside the spinal cord um and then eventually the brain uh, uh branches in the front so that you can get the two halves of this of the uh, cerebral cortex 
and the two lateral ventricles. So really the entire brain is just a long tube with a fork in the front of it and that's it. Um, the, the other thing that's important about this is that we already have some distinct organization of the nervous system. And the very top part of the neural tube is something called the neural crest. So this part of the, of the embryo actually is not entirely going to be um, just nervous system. It, it, um, it's going to be partially nervous system, but there are a lot of things that get developed out of the neural crest. This is a list of what those things are, and we're going to walk through it. So from the neural crest, we have uh, odontoblasts. Odontoblasts give rise to teeth. And one thing that you could imagine is that in these animals, we have reduced tooth size. Um, the other thing is um, we, uh, um, there's, there's cartilaginous um, chondrocytes that come into the ears. Uh, we have melanocytes, which give rise to pigmentation in the skin. So melanocytes are the pigmented cells in the skin. Um, we have cartilages that make up the tail, right? That are going to influence how long it is and whether it curls or not. But the other thing that emerges out of the neural crest is the adrenal glands. And that's very interesting because the adrenal glands are a core part of the stress response. And if you're selecting for tameness, in a population, you might have some individuals that are going to be more tame than others. They're going to be less fearful of humans than others. And one thing that would likely be happening within those individuals is that they're going to have smaller or more compromised adrenal glands. Their adrenal glands are going to be somewhat reduced. They're going to have a, 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 de a diminished stress response. So if you start selecting for these animals and you're 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 picking these tame animals um, and you're breeding them together you're going to be pushing the adrenal glands to be smaller and smaller or compromised in some way right they're not going to be functioning nearly as as robustly as they would in an aggressive or even the wild stock so if you're doing this and you're selecting for more compromised adrenal glands during this process there's going to be genes that are going to be involved that um that are going to potentially be affecting the neural crest. So you might be selecting against genes that are going to affect how much of the neural crest um, gets pushed out into the rest of the body. And so if you're selecting for um, smaller adrenal glands, you're going to have now, say, you might also have reduced melanocytes. So now you're gonna get some pigmentation changes. You're gonna have reduced odontoblasts. So now you got reduced tooth size. You're gonna have reduced chondrocytes, which also comes out of the neural crest weakened cartilage in the tail and the ears, a shortened snout. So now you're starting to see some of these things. And of course, neural crest contributes to the overall brain of, as well. And therefore you're also gonna have reduced brain size. And so it's thought that with the selection pressure that that's how you're getting these things. So why don't we look through this? So we got the selection for tameness and what this might be doing with the selection of, of tameness is, is some, you're, you got reduced neural crest input. So with the selection for tameness, now you're inducing a sort of mild neurochristopathy. Uh, neurochristopathy, that's a tough word to say. And so for the selected traits, we're reducing the, we're, we're trying to get tameness, we're trying to get learning in humans is okay, reduced fear, reduced stress. And this is a reduction of the overall adrenal glands and also like sympathetic ganglia. Um, but for unselected byproducts, what you might be getting because you're inducing this mild neurochristopathy is that you're going to get white patches and floppy ears. Uh, you're going to get changes in osteoblasts, which are uh, going to give rise to the muzzles and jaws and the odontoblasts, so smaller tooth size. And then, of course, with that, you, you're, you're potentially going to also see compromised reduced brain size as well. Um, yeah, so the, this is, uh, you know, some of these things are actually are probably continue to be selected for. So when you find animals that have white patches, they're cute. So you're going to start breeding them with white patches. Floppy ears are cute and reduced teeth is nice. So that doesn't hurt so much when they bite, right? So there's going to be some mixing here of whether these things are selected or not. Um, you know, it's probably pretty unlikely that, that there's actually like distinct selection for smaller brains. Um, what, you know, like I said, one can argue that maybe you're selecting for dumber animals. So maybe there's that, but that's not necessarily the case. So let's talk a little bit about like, what are these, some of these genetic underlying genetic changes.
So there's been analysis done in the tame and aggressive foxes of what kinds of genes are expressed in the brain. And um, so, and, and this is one that took into account that we have like tame foxes that were at the very beginning of the experiment. And then when the experiment was really going on, when we had the aggressive line where that was more cemented in 1970. So they, they came from slightly different stocks. So the, you know, it was taking that into account. And then there's just a conventional population that was not selected, right? So we have the same thing. We've got aggressive foxes, tame foxes, and conventional foxes. And they went through and they snipped out parts of the brain and then they extracted the mRNA and they looked to see which genes are being expressed in the different parts of the brain. I'm not going to walk through it in great detail. Um, but one thing I will point out is that, um, so this is something called a volcano blot, plot, a volcano blot, where they're comparing uh, the ch differences in expression of genes between tame foxes and aggressive foxes. And this is looking at fold change. So the, um, you know, m most of the genes, so all these are different genes. And so all each dot is a different gene and you can see most of them are between one and negative one. So this is like a, a little bit above the, um, the, uh, the, the, the aggressive fox. This is a little bit about, uh, below the aggressive fox. So these would be genes that are slightly higher in the, um, the aggressive line and lower in the tame. And these would be higher in the tame and less in the aggressive. So here's some genes that seem to be particularly high. And these are significant genes after you do some of the statistics where they see that these genes are higher in the tame foxes than in the aggressive and that these genes would be lower. And here's some validation just for the two highest ones where they looked in the cortex. Sure enough, the, so they did this again, but they used a different technique, which is called quantitative uh, PCR or quantitative polymerase chain reaction. So a completely different replicate. And you can see that the, yes, sure enough, the mRNA is higher in the cortex and the forebrain for both of these genes um, in the tame foxes versus the aggressive. So whatever these genes are, I don't know. Um, they did some network analysis to see what kinds of genes were changed in expression. And one thing they found is that a bunch of different genes that were related to serotonin synapse function were differing between the two foxes. And that's interesting because we know that serotonin is related to overall mood. And so if there's some changes in the expression of, of certain aspects to serotonin re regulation in serotonergic neurons and at serotonergic sy synapses, you might expect mood or say facilitation of differences in aggressiveness being there as well and, and differences in anxiety. <clears throat> they also looked at SNPs. So SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So with this information, they, they can also look to see, are there any genetic changes? Like not just changes in gene expression, but changes, uh, mutations that are found in some groups versus the other. And so they, you know, there's a way of doing this where you can find the same thing, like whether they're more likely to be found in the tame foxes versus not. And what you can see is that, um, yeah, there's some differences there as well. And they found, so they found SNPs that were different between the two foxes. Another thing that they found is that, that there were genetic changes detected in the metabotropic glutamate receptor. So that's going to affect um, the way neurons function within the brain. And they also found a bunch of genes related to neural crest. So this would be an indication that these are genes that might have been selected for simply because it was related to tameness and affecting the adrenal glands, but it also would have potentially affected the nervous system leading to a smaller brain. Uh, another gene uh, that's a part of this is the uh, GRK7. This is a gene that regulates uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH release. And you can see that this is one of the, um, one of the, uh, this is the highest difference that they found in, in this entire data set where they found it was a significantly higher in aggressive foxes than it was in domesticated foxes. And so this one gene, which is a regulator of ACTH is much higher in aggressive foxes. Therefore, you know, you could imagine that there's going to be some difference in the way their um, adrenal access and their stress hormone access works. Uh, cortisol levels are also lower in domesticated foxes. So this is domesticated foxes at different ages. And what we can see here is that these are the domesticated foxes of levels of cortisol shown here. You can see that um, they kind of start at the same, a uh, little bit lower at um, in the domesticated versions versus the uh, 
the aggressive ones, but as they get older, it just gets worse and worse for the aggressive ones. So by 60 months of age, there's like a huge difference in cortisol levels. This is also true for females. Um, this is domesticated versus um, uh, aggressive. And you can see uh, at all these different points along um, a, a pregnancy and lactation that we've got, um, you know, over decreased overall cortisol levels. So, okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a concept called self-domestication. So this is an idea that there are certain species that have domesticated themselves. So not quite nearly as much as like what we might see with domesticated species as at like versions, like say different breeds of dogs and different breeds of cats. Um, there's speculation that this may have happened to humans as well. That there may have been uh, some kind of thing that happened with self-domestication. So one interesting thing, of course, is that within humans across evolution, um, you know, our ancient ancestors from 3.5 million years ago. So this would be like Australopithecus, Australopithecus Africanus. Um, and this would be like Homo erectus. This would be, uh, maybe this is Homo erectus. This is Homo habilis. Um, I know I'm a nerd that I know all these things, but I, I studied evolution as an undergraduate. Um, the, uh, Brain size increased. So this is showing cubic centimeters, cc's, and we can calculate out what the overall brain case would have been. And brain capacity has obviously increased in, in humans compared to our ancient uh, ancestors. Despite the fact that they walked upright, they had a brain size that was less than half the size of what we have in our current modern huge brains. But one thing that's really interesting is that when you look at more recent um, um, more recent but still very old skulls of humans we see something uh, a, a very interesting pattern so let's look at that so it turns out that modern brains of humans are actually slightly smaller than the brains of humans from about fifty thousand years ago in fact it's about somewhere on the order of 10 to 15 percent so when you compare even older Homo sapiens from 50,000 years ago or Homo sapiens Neanderthal, um, which is considered to be a subspecies of humans, um, the brains of modern humans are smaller compared to those older versions. Our brains have gotten smaller in over 50,000 years. This has led to the hypothesis that perhaps humans have undergone some sort of self domestication. So one reason why this might be is that if you, if you think about it, humans, um, we live in a largely domesticated environment now, like civilization is one thing that's unique about humans. Um, uh, there aren't too many species of mammals where you can put the, an unrelated male in the same room with another male and they don't know each other and they don't tr fight immediately and, or even try to kill each other. Uh, many, many species will have that level of aggression th amongst mammals. Um, and usually it's a fight to figure out who's dominant and who's, who's not. And you could potentially argue that human males do this to some degree anyway, not necessarily fight, but you even see like stupid wrestling that stupid boys will do sometimes. Anyway. Um, they don't try to fight and kill each other. Sometimes it happens, of course, but that's very, very rare. So for, in order for civilization to actually happen, in order for humans to, to, to live in group, large groups where now people are largely unrelated to each other, or there are going to be people that are unrelated to each other, they need to be tame. They need to not have high levels of aggression. They need, they, they shouldn't be fearful of things that aren't familiar. And so there's this thought process that one thing that has helped humans to become civilized is that they went through a process of self-domestication and then that humans turns out they have some of these self-domestication features, such as a small brain size, such as having a smaller snout compared to their counterparts. So in this study, the, the they um this is an experiment where they well an experiment an analysis of 
of a bunch of different modern day skulls and they looked also looked at some neolithic skulls so these are skulls around 40 50,000 years ago and they measured a bunch of different features of these skulls and they found differences each little star represents a significant difference between males and females um but one thing that was important of course i mean this is just evidence here's the data showing that the um ancient brains were larger than modern brains uh right here cranial capacity so cranial capacity you can see that the darker red bar is larger than the the light blue bar and this is true for females and for males so they had larger brains <clears throat> so the idea of course then with humans is that they share some of these self-domestication features we have of course individuals with patchy pigmentation um arguably all humans have um sort of a neon a neoteny type of appearance it's thought that humans, uh, when you compare a, uh, an adult human to a baby human, obviously there are differences, but there aren't nearly as different as like when you compare, say, a baby chimpanzee to an adult chimpanzee. An adult chimpanzee looks quite a bit different than a baby chimpanzee. And the same, I mean, even worse is for gorillas. So like a baby gorilla looks like almost like a human-ish. But as they get older, like an adult gorilla does not look like a human at all. But if you look at all different kinds of humans, there aren't that, there aren't that, there isn't that level of stark difference between the infant and the adult form. And so, so some of the self-domestication could be part of that in that there, we have a short snout. We don't have this like big snout that grows. Our teeth have gotten smaller over the years. So the modern teeth are much smaller than, than our ancient ancestors. Um, and that, you know, perhaps the, the, the tameness has changed as well. So there's been some work on this, um, uh, just doing some genetic work, looking at genes that we know are related to domestication, genes that we know that are involved with the neural crest and genes that are involved with schizophrenia. And, um, and so this is one idea where we're looking at the expression of these different genes and the correlation that they might that they have and um, the overlap that we see so in this study um, we see genes that are related to domestication that some percent of them are also found in uh, genes related to schizophrenia and genes related to neural crests and so the whole point of this study is to see they're, they're suggesting that some of the changes that happen in schizophrenia the some of these genetic changes that happen in schizophrenia that that it might actually be related to some of the genes that have been selected for to have tameness and um, that are part of the domestication process. And so then if, if there's been a mutation in those genes, then you, would, you, could, you could argue that that would be reversing some of the uh, acute tameness and civilizing quote unquote features that we would expect to see in you know, a non-schizophrenic human. So, uh, so th these guys are arguing that there's this relationship. Now, that that's not proof. This is just this is just a discussion. And they also talk about like in relationship to linguistics in this paper. And these guys actually do this a couple of times in a couple of different papers. Um, so it's just an argument. We're going to look at a couple of other arguments, right? They, these are hypotheses. Um, one hypothesis again from the same group um, showing that language impairments in autism spectrum disorder resulting from failed domestication of the human brain. Okay, so this was largely just an argument that they put together where they say autism, that it pretends with particular physical features that correlate with the last lack of domestication syndrome. So these, uh, so individuals that have autism, they tend to have actually larger brain sizes. They tend to be aggressive and irritable and have abnormal responses to social cues and anxiety disorders. Uh, there are certain facial anomalies that are pretty typical within autism. They have tooth problems. They have a very distinct um, um, abnormal response of the um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Uh, they have generalized overgrowth in infancy and their adrenal gland tends to hyperfunction. They have high levels of androgens. They have androgens that tend to be higher than like uh, neurotypical individuals. Um, yeah, and they, they uh, occasionally, we find some forms of autism seem to be uh, linked to hypomelanosis. So some changes within the melanin that occurs within the skin.
So these are all things that one could argue are related to the domestication syndrome and that those individuals with autism, if there's a mutation in a gene or if there's been some sort of effect that has uh, um, affected this developmental process related to the neural crest, you could imagine um, that this could this would correlate with some of these other features that we also know are dependent upon neural crest. So this isn't to say that like, oh, those people with autism, that they're not fully evolved or whatever. That's not to what we're saying at all. It's an indication that there could be a mutation within or mutations within this suite of genes that would be important for the neural crest and that you would have similar changes happening because we, you know, the domestication syndrome can inform how, why we might see some of these other physical features, these physical phenotypes that go along with the behavioral phenotypes. So in this study, they also looked at expression of genes related to autism spectrum disorder and domestication in, uh, and they looked, compared it to chimpanzee, which obviously wouldn't have this, this difference and they compare it to humans. So chimp to neurotypical humans and then autism spectrum disorder to neurotypical humans. And what they're arguing is that some of these genes that are, that are say decreased in expression in, in humans, this also appears to be similar in chimpanzees where they obviously have not undergone self-domestication. So they're arguing that there's some sort of genetic profiles that seem to correlate with, along with these things that would be indication of, of, um, of, these, of these domestication like genes. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is something called Williams syndrome. This is a condition in patients um, that uh, where they have a deletion of a portion of chromosome seven. They have like 30 genes that are missing. And these patients, they, um, you know, it's considered a form of mental retardation, but they have some really unique features. Uh, one of the most prominent is that they are very hypersocial. They're super duper friendly. They are not wary of strangers at all. This can actually lead to trouble for them because they're, they're too trusting, but they're intensely friendly individuals. They do have certain intellectual deficits. In particular, they have impaired spatial cognition uh, to the point where it can be kind of debilitating, but they have other, uh, other things that go along with this. They, have, they excel with musical abilities and they actually outperform subjects with other development dis disorders with language tasks. So, um, so it's a complex suite of features that they have. Um, so it, the, again, this is the same group, this Italian group that's doing this, um, uh, arguing that certain, certain uh, human um, disabilities and disorders might be indication of the domestication syndrome. So um, unlike the autism spectrum uh, disorder, uh, people with Williams syndrome actually have reduced brain size compared to neurotypical individuals. They're, they're said to have el an elfin face with a short, flat nose bridge and wide set eyes. They also have pointy ears. Um, so their ear, their chondrocytes have been affected. They tend to have a very small and retrusive jaw. So the jaw tends to be pushed back into their head. They have very small teeth. They have hypersociality, uh, reduced visual spatial abilities, enhanced gaze attention. So they tend to focus unlike uh, so the opposite of autism they have very decreased aggression increased attentive behavior anxiety disorders and attention problems as well um, they also have an abnormal response to the HPG, hpa axis and in this case what happens is that they have decreased cortisol response to challenging tasks they also tend to have elevated oxytocin and vasopressin levels um, and obviously abnormal adrenal function if it's not producing enough cortisol there's accelerated sexual maturity. And then sometimes what we see is that there's depigmentation, particularly in the eye. Um, so the iris can be different. And they also have premature graying of the hair. So the hair tends to gray quicker. So what they would argue is that this domestication syndrome is um, that these guys are hyper domesticated in some ways. So they would be saying that these suite of features um, that there might be some mutation that has happened along with these 30 genes. These 30 genes may have affected the expression of other genes, which has now just exacerbated the problem and has affected this entire suite of features that just go along with development and that it would have impacted their ability to, um, well, to end up with the neurotypical and overall uh, phenotypical features that we, that we usually associate with um, you know, unaffected humans.
where these individuals seem to be hyper domesticated in some ways. So I'm going to leave it there. Hope this uh, talk was interesting and uh, we will see you later.